cari ospiti, I would like to welcome, welcome you to the second edition of the Galileo Galilei Science Festival. This event begins today and will last until Sunday morning with a program rich in presentations, discussions and interaction with the guests and also with students coming from selected schools, two schools in Frankfurt. Since the birth of modern science and of the modern scientific method in the 17th century, Italy has always been a country with an extraordinary tradition of science and research. Many universities, like those in Padua and Pisa, were in the past and are now at the forefront of scientific and technological research in many fields. Furthermore, as Professor Spada has said, International cooperation is very important in this field, and we believe that this is a main sector of activity also from, from our point of view. We think it is of fundamental importance to foster scientific culture and disseminate scientific and technological knowledge. We must do this in particular in schools, looking at teenagers and younger generations. Italian scientists carry out their activity not only in Italy, but also abroad. Many of them give an important contribution to the research programs of German and European research centers. And as a consulate, we wanted to create an occasion of networking for the many Italian scientists and researchers in Germany, and also acknowledge the extraordinary work that they accomplish. In this framework, and for these reasons, we organize this Galileo Galilei Science and, S and Space Festival. We organize this event in Darmstadt, the city of science, which hosts many national and international research centers and agencies, and vibrant and prestigious universities. As you can see from the program of the festival, leading topics of the presentations will be the latest discoveries in astronomy and physics and in space technologies. The choice of these topics is due to the fact that Hessen and Darmstadt are leading regions in Europe and worldwide in these fields. Many Italian professors and scientists contribute to the success of science and research projects in Hessen and Darmstadt through their knowledge, their passion, and their labor. My personal thanks go to the Space Operations Center of the European Space Agency. Dear Director Spada, thank you for, thank you, you and your staff for hosting us in these three days, and thank you for your extraordinary support in organizing this festival. A special thank goes to UMETSAT and to the GSI, the Helmut Zentrum für Schwerjudenforschung, for their valuable support in organizing the program and identifying speakers and topics of discussions. A warm thank goes to Paolo Ferri, Michele Santoriello, and Maria Cristina Belloni. Without your engagement and passion, this festival would have not been possible. And obviously, I want to express my deepest gratitude to all the speakers and the sponsors, among which the Italian firm Italy 100 on I also wish you to enjoy the presentations and to engage in fruitful discussions in these three days. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a big pleasure for me to present at the opening of the Science Festival 2022. It's 10 years already that uh, we live uh, with the Higgs boson. But I remember those times at CERN. Well, it was not a rock concert, but uh, we spent the night in our sleeping bags outside the main auditorium of CERN in order to be sure to have a seat on that room where the day after the discovery of the century would have been announced. Predicted in 1964 and discovered in 2021, announced in 2000, uh, 2011, 2012, uh, was then finally claimed. Uh, this elusive particle has been searched for many years in the accelerator all around the world. And, uh, 
It is a big honor for me to introduce you the speaker, the first speaker of tonight. Um, physicist uh, at CERN, of course, uh, and professor uh, in Italy, in Pisa. He was uh, one of the rock stars of uh, this event. Uh, he was the spokesperson of uh, the CMS experiment, uh, one of the uh, world's largest, greatest uh, experimental community that, together with Atlas, uh, working at LHC in a close uh, collaboration competition, um, brought us this uh, incredible particle. Um, but he has always been involved uh, in uh, high energy experimental physics uh, and worked, uh, contributed in many experiments. Let me name NA1, NA7, not a big fantasy in the names. Uh, on the other hand, Aleph uh, uh, at CERN, but also across the ocean at Fermilab in CDF. And finally, in CMS, he was mostly responsible of the central tracker, the one that measures where the particle go, uh, based on semiconductor devices, and lately, spokesperson, so the boss of everybody. Um, the awards I have to read because they are too many. Uh, award the Commendatore all'Ordine del Merito and the Medal of Honor by the Italian President uh, Giorgio Napolitano. He also won uh, the Fundamental Physics Prize, the Enrico Fermi Prize of the Italian Physics Society, uh, but also mm, the highest honor of uh, the city of Pisa, awarded on the occasion of the 450 years uh, celebration from the birth of, uh, guess who, Galileo Galilei. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight is here with us, Professor Guido Torelli. I'm a bit embarrassed because uh, it's presented as a rock star. I consider that to sing, I could maybe, because I like to sing in a, in a baroque core quarries, but probably it's not what you want to listen to that. Anyway, many thanks to, to the for this presentation, uh, uh, very much. And uh, thanks to the general consulate, uh, Dr. Sama, and also Santo, very Michele Santoriello, which is there. And, and uh, they insisted so much uh, that uh, I, at the end I, I, I accepted. But I'm happy to, to, to have accepted me here. Uh, today I will tell you uh, uh, the story, the story of the, of the discovery. Um, a couple of ten years ago, and some of the implications that we're going to discuss. Uh, uh, what we have learned from this discovery in, in the ten years from 2012 to today. So th this picture you see is a, is a composed picture. Uh, at the center you have this uh, eye, like a huge, um, huge eye, which is a section of CMS, and. And there is an event which is a uh, Higgs boson decay in, in four particles that uh, are muons in this case, they are particularly interesting particles. And I put together some picture, uh, meaning that uh, from high energy physics or for space science, in, in these activities you have the source of technologies, of things that will change the life of thousands or millions of persons. We should never forget it. We give it for granted, we consider it normal, but we have only to remember that fundamental science is the main source of innovation and technology that changes daily life. Sometimes when I ask, when I'm asked by minister or president, what is the purpose of your activity, they only answer, there is no purpose, you want just to learn how matter works or how nature behaves. But in doing that, we change your life. We change everybody's life. We, change, we invent technologies that change in the, uh, the life of our community. Uh, today, we've not discovered, we've not discussed it, the technology that we have been originated from this research in 20, 30 years. We could spend another conference on this. We we'll discuss of the implications in terms of our vision of the world, which has nothing to do with technology. 
But sometimes the change in the vision of the world is as important as the technology that this activity is. Ten years ago, it was July 2012, uh, this is the MAC at CERN, the big accelerator, and these are the detectors, CMS and data that produced uh, these plots that tell you nothing, but uh, for us, those are important plots in which we see an excess of events at a certain mass, which is 125 GB. That means that there is something happening there, something which is not compatible with uh, the ground, with fluctuations. That means a new particle. But the story started much earlier. Um, you will see, 1964 is the, is the years in which uh, a couple of young, uh, actually three young theorists decided uh, to propose this idea. Uh, but uh, the story dates back uh, much earlier. Uh, basically initiated eight years before. Uh, and it was initiated by an Italian, a, a giant of the, of the international science, which is Enrico Fermi. Uh, I used uh, this picture of Fermi when he was a student at the University, University of Pisa, by the way. Uh, it, it is coming to Pisa in 1918. He's a very brilliant student. Immediately, everybody recognized that this would be, uh, would be a genius, would be a scientist that will change uh, dramatically. Uh, uh, even during the studies, so this is quite, uh, quite uh, unusual, but sometimes it happens. Uh, and when he was uh, 32, in 1933, so about uh, eight years before, uh, he concentrated his attention on uh, an elusive uh, phenomenon, which is the uh, uh, radioactive beta decay, meaning uh, an element that changes its nature emitting electrons. You know? It's a tiny effect, uh, something that was not considered very relevant. You know? But uh, with his view, he changed completely and dramatically the world. He started thinking that behind this uh, effect that uh, happened uh, to strange elements and it had no impact on daily life, it was a phenomena that uh, uh, interested, uh, switched on the curiosity only of, of some, maybe 20 scientists in the world, maybe 100 at those times, were interested to these activities. And he started thinking, what is behind this? And he claimed that there is a new force. Imagine, 32 years, a phenomenon. Take a look at it, just for a moment to the arrogance. Arrogance in good sense. I am 32, I, am, I, I discovered the new force of nature. Can, can you imagine? A new force, a new interaction. You don't, you don't see what I see. I see a new interaction happening there. Behind this elusive phenomena, there is a new major intera interaction of nature. He was right, today we know that he was right, but at the time, this uh, idea was so revolutionary that uh, his paper was not published, was, was rejected. Na nature rejected the paper because it is too, um, is a quotation, too speculative to have some connection with physics. The paper was published by CNN uh, in Italy. It, it, is, it is the most important paper, for maybe in the, uh, one of the most important in the last century. And uh, just to give you an idea that sometimes the revolutionary ideas uh, are produced by young people, first, information, and secondly, the, the establishment uh, has some resistance in accepting those ideas because they change completely the vision, no? the vision of the world. Uh, but this is the starting point of what we call the standard model of elementary particles. It is like a pin. Everything started from there, from this speculation that came up to be correct, to be absolutely correct. And he was the first one to uh, think to this force as a form of electromagnetic interaction. He used a formalism that was similar to the, electron, to the one described in the electromagnetic interaction. No? It was described very well by the Maxwell equation. There was a clear formal, uh, formal uh, explanation of everything. And so there is something happening which appears to be similar to this, but much more weaker. At the beginning, this force was called the Fermi interaction. Later on, we call it is the weak interaction. Huh? 
because it's much, much weaker than the electromagnetic interaction. By the way, this weak interaction is responsible of a huge amount of phenomena, including, uh, including what happens in the stars. It's an incredible amount of phenomena that you can describe thanks, thanks to this. 30 years later, Glash, Weinberg, and Salam um, putting together this pillar and adding additional element, they produced uh, uh, the unified theory of the weak and the electromagnetic interaction. Indeed, uh, these two forces of nature, the electromagnetic interaction, photons, uh, laser, uh, light, uh, optics, uh, uh, magnetic field, magne electric field, all this, uh, and the weak interaction, which uh, dominates the beta decay of radioactive elements, they are the same interaction. This is the basic of the, the standard model of elementary particles. Uh, it appears to be two different forces, but actually it is one single force which has different behavior. In their theory, they predicted the uh, three boson, very massive. Uh, here I have to, to say something that is normal for, for scientists and physicists, but maybe not so for the general public. Uh, an interaction in, in physics is carried by something, by another particle. And uh, the range of this interaction depends on the mass of this uh, carrier. So if the carrier of the interaction is very light, for example, the photon, the photon carries the electromagnetic interaction. And it's so light, massless, that electromagnetic interaction can reach infinity. Can go, the, the range is infinite. If the carrier is very heavy, uh, then the range of the interaction is very small. So very simple. The weak interaction was neglected for millennia because the range is at the level of subnuclear distances. And why it is so short, the range of interest? Because the carriers are very heavy. They call these carriers W and Z with an expected mass 100, roughly speaking, 80, 90 times the mass of a proton. So a carrier which is a very heavy photon, very heavy photon, 90, 80 times the mass of the proton, an extremely heavy carrier. And this is why the range of this interaction is so small. This carrier cannot travel too much, travel only very small distance, dies inside the nucleus, or dies inside the, the subnuclear distance. But there was still a detail, a detail to be uh, worked out, to be understood. Here I use the sumo fight uh, against the young boy or, or, or um, a girl, I don't know. Uh, because basically what uh, we say is that uh, we have the same interaction which is carried by a very light object, photon, and a very heavy object, W and Z. How, how it is possible that the massive W and Z carry the same interaction brought by the massless photon? What is the mechanism producing this difference? No? One carrier is massless, the other one is very heavy. What is happening there? There was a puzzle around this, and the, the best theorists of that time, we are talking of the 60s, basically, they tried to find an explanation for this. What are the mechanisms by which a photon remains massless, while a W and Z becomes, become very heavy? There were many proposals, but none of them was satisfactory until two or three, actually three young scientists, again in the 30s, once again, very young. Some of them um, new in the field, again, with the same arrogance of, of Fermi when he was young. They, they say, okay, we have understood everything. Um, the world, the universe, uh, imagine also the the reaction of the, of the, of the old professor. No? The, you see these two, three guys coming, and they were not even experts in the field. Some of them, they were not in particle physics. They were dealing with solid state or mathematical physics. They, don't have, they didn't have experience in this. So they come and say, oh, we have the solution. It's very simple, the solution. The universe 
this entire universe is filled up with something that we have understood that you don't understand. It's filled with a, with a new scalar field. So the difference in mass is something coming dyna dynamically. There is a field, again, a new field, an invisible field. You don't see the field, I see the field. No, the other ones so the young theorists. Uh, which is there everywhere. The particles interacting with this field, they acquire the mass. If the interaction is very strong, the mass is heavy. If the interaction is very light, the mass is light. If there is no interaction, the particle is massless. It's a very simple explanation. But again, at the beginning, their explanation was ignored. At the point that some of them were tempted to change the field, to, to stop doing research. I know some of them. Was a good friend, a couple of them, one died, unfortunately, uh, 11 years ago. Their idea was put there in a few papers, and it was ignored for a few, few years. Then it was resumed. People started, was Weinberg, basically, the Nobel Prize, that started thinking, these guys have the right approach. Probably they are right. Probably what they say is correct. Right? There is a, a field uh, which is produced by a new particle that Weinberg named the, the scalar boson, the Higgs boson. Uh, the two other, Braut and Engler, they were not happy of this name because they were among the inventor of this new idea. They, they did it independently. They were not working together. There were two groups uh, working independently. Uh, but uh, the, this new field was named by the name of Higgs, because why the new Higgs? He didn't, he didn't know uh, Braut and Engler. So uh, this created uh, some, uh, some discussion, even, even now. If, uh, if, I ever, if I give a presentation and, I, and it is... Uh, uh, François Ingler, which is still uh, living, is in the audience and, uh, and he, he, he listened to me and I named Nick's boson, he, he, he reacted. So I have to, if there is Ingler uh, uh, in the audience, I call it Braut Ingler Nick's boson. And then he said it. But the general audience and also the scientific audience now know, knows it as the as Higgs boson. So, is, is an idea of having a, a field, a new field, which is not confined in a small region. It occupies the entire universe. Have you an idea of the dimension of the universe? Okay. In this entire object, there is a field, and the interaction of elementary particle with this field produces the differences in mass. W and Z interact very strongly with the Higgs field, and they become very massive. The photon is neutral to, to, to this field and remains massless. The problem is that very soon uh, the, the, there were the discovery of the W and Z. Uh, first of all, there was an indirect discovery in, in the 70s, but uh, it was awarded the Nobel Prize to Glasher, Weinberg, and Salami in 1979 because there were indirect evidence that their theory was correct that the Z particle, one of these heavy bosons, was in the data. Then there was the discovery of W and Z by another student from Pisa, which is Carlo Rubia, again, extremely brilliant uh, student when he was young, extremely brilliant scientist when he grew up as a scientist. Uh, and the Nobel Prize was assigned uh, to him and Van der Meer in 1984. But the, 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 the other element of the theory, the Higgs boson, was not there. So there was attempts since uh, those years to, 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 to try to find out this uh, elusive particle. The, the, unfortunately, the theory didn't predict the mass of this particle. Why the theory predicted the mass of the W and Z? So the hunt was relatively easy. Nothing is easy in science, but we knew where to look at. No? Uh, Carlo Rubia knew that there, was, there would have been something at 80 or 90 GV. So he, he went to CERN and asked CERN if we change the ex accelerator and we produce collisions between the protons and the protons with this particular energy, if W and Z theory is correct, we are going to discover because the energy is right to collect this, uh, uh, to produce this new particle. This is not the case of the X boson. This boson, the theory does not predict the mass could be as light as uh, 
uh, a few MeV or as heavy as a few hundred GeV. So the theory is free. There is a, is a free parameter. Uh, at the beginning, they looked at the, in the data of all possible accelerators at the time, but there was no um, no evidence. So there was a this started they created the, uh, in in some sense the story, you know, the the most elusive particle, the, the the holy grail of particles was born there, you know, in, in those years, because at the beginning everybody was uh, very confident of being able to, to discover it soon, while the, the entire generation of excellent scientists were, was not able to find it. To find it. And this uh, basically happened until the new generation of young scientists, again, young scientists, in their 30s, they tried to do something that was never done before, but he tried to, to, to find a solution. So there is this particle, uh, if it is there, we are going to discover. To discover it, we need uh, an accelerator that was never conceived before, which is extremely large. And uh, we have to equip with, uh, with the detectors that uh, are extremely challenging. So it's, it's the beginning of another story. Um, I spend a few words to explain why we, we need particle accelerator. Uh, basically, the, the, the question is very simple. This is Elena. My, uh, granddaughter, uh, when she was four, now she's uh, 14, so it's, uh, she's, a, she's a teenager. But when she was four, in one summer uh, night in, in Sardinia, with the, the, it was the 11th, uh, 10th of August, the, the, the night of the falling stars, uh, she asked me the question that every kid uh, has asked uh, somebody. What, what, what is all this? this it's the same question on which we are trying to give an answer. What is the origin of the, the matter universe that, uh, that surrounds, surrounds us? And to answer this question, we need a, a journey. We need to organize a very special journey. It's not a simple question, and it's not a simple journey. It's a journey back in time. We have to go very back in time. And the reason is that our universe is very old. The, the Dolomites, the beautiful Dolomites, the rock is 250 million years old. The solar system is four, five billion years. The Big Bang, 13.8 billion years. So we are talking a very old object. It's old and very cold, extremely cold, old and cold. It was very hot at the beginning, it's becoming very, very cold today. The outer space temperature is a few degrees Kelvin, minus 170, so it's an extremely cold object. And clearly we cannot study its origin looking at today's condition. We put here a newborn baby and a, a, an old man over 100 years. No? Clearly there is a connection between the two, but it will be considered crazy if I want to understand the, the behavior of, of a young baby with studying a, a person which has 100 years. No? Really. So we cannot basically understand the baby universe uh, if we don't invent something new, because the condition of today's universe, the one in which we live, is too different from the, from the initial conditions. And so we have invented two, root, two, two, two roots, uh, two roads. Uh, one is the road of the super microscope, the one that I'm, I'm using and following. Basically, we produce in laboratory the, the particles that, that were populating the primordial universe. The primordial universe is very hot and very young was populated by particles that uh, basically disappeared with time and with decreasing temperature. We try to understand what were those conditions basically creating in laboratory the same conditions. And, and something completely different uh, do our friends, astrophysics, astrophysicists or astronomers, <coughs> they, they use super telescopes. They look at objects very, very large. You know, we use we look at the, the, the tiniest uh, object uh, conceivable, the, the, the smallest possible distances, while they look at the largest possible distance. They look very far away to, to objects which are huge, uh, galaxy, a cluster of galaxy, or the entire universe. Uh, basically, in our case, using particle accelerator, you can, you can see the, the things in different ways. Colliding particles of high energy, you consider for each accelerator the real figure of merit is the energy. So the highest the energy, uh, the, the largest are the possibilities to, to discover new things. 
Uh, energy means that you can look deeper into matter because the size that you can explore is one over the energy. So higher the energy, smaller the size. This is the, the view of uh, De Broglie. Or Einstein, the higher the energy, the higher the mass you can produce. You, you, you use energy to, to heat the vacuum and the vacuum produces particles. And the particles are as massive as the more massive as the more higher is the energy. This is the approach of Einstein or Boltzmann. You, you use energy to heat the vacuum, to, to increase the temperature. Now, temperature and energy are basically uh, proportional. So high energy means high temperature. So I create in a small, tiny fraction of vacuum the initial conditions of the early universe. The early universe was very hot. Uh, I cannot create a new universe, but I can create in a, in a very small amount of space, a temperature which is similar to the temperature of the daily universe. And in this environment, I can take a look and see what happens. This is why we produce a huge accelerator, 27 kilometers, because we need to produce high collisions of high energy protons. And the other extremes, the super telescopes, in this case, we, we are able to discover myriad of worlds in a tiny fraction of the sky. I was I'm always in love with this, uh, with this deep field uh, image of Hubble, in which uh, in a tiny fraction of dark uh, uh, sky, you discover thousands of galaxies. For me, this is a, is a marvel. You know? Imagining that in each one of these galaxies, there are 100 billion stars, that around each of these stars, roughly speaking, there are planets. Take a look just for a second to this. Now take a look to, to all these galaxies and imagine uh, how many planets are, are uh, in this. Uh, we, can, we can see them, but we have to imagine. Now, we know today that uh, it's quite, quite popular the presence of planets around the star. So if not uh, around each star, a very large fraction of each star, there are planets orbiting. Take a look to this, uh, imagining the, the, the myriad of worlds that uh, are in this picture. And clearly, looking very far away, you can observe indeed the birth of new stars. So you can see phenomena that are happening billions of years ago. So you, you really look back, back in time. You see, you see leave no? the, the, the birth of new galaxies, of new stars. Uh, and eventually, you, you try to go as close as possible to the Big Bang, looking at the cosmic microwave the ground, or beyond the studying uh, its properties is the story of many technical challenges. Because if you want to build this device, you have to, to face uh, all possible challenges. Our detectors are a sort of water cathedrals in which uh, you put together thousands of people and you invent new technologies because there is nothing you can buy in the shell. Basically, what you see there in this picture, there is nothing that uh, was available uh, a few years before. We had to develop together with the best companies the, the best sensor, the best devices, the best uh, electronics, the best uh, chip, the best computers. We have to, to, and this is why technology receives a push. Uh, we have to produce new gadgets, new, new devices. Uh, at the end of this effort, uh, uh, there was a fantastic detector produced by the entire world. This is a picture of CMS, the experiment in Dead for several years. Um, there is a fraction of the collaborators because we cannot gather them together. We, uh, we have a feast in June, basically, in which we celebrate the achievements of the year. And here you see maybe 600 people. Uh, CMS is 4,000 scientists and engineers, uh, including 1,000 students. Can, can you imagine what you can do with 1,000 students? Students which are uh, selected among the best students of all universities. So it's not only, they are really some of the best, uh, the most brilliant minds uh, in, the, in the world. This is why we can, we can obtain results, because we have this uh, continuous flow of, of excellent students. Uh, it's more than one up to 200 institutes from 55 countries, so basically a very large fraction of the, of the world which has universities, which has some industries and technology. Basically. But uh, it's not a story of, um, uh, only a story of uh, technology, it's also a story of, of deep emotions. 
uh, imagine when, when, you, when you see Real Madrid winning the, the, the Champions League, Ancelotti. Look at this picture. It looks like they are celebrating uh, a soccer team uh, or some victory. You know? Another thing that I want to highlight always, you know very well since you are close to the scientific activities. Uh, our field is, uh, is a, there are a lot of technical issues, but it's full of emotion. If you have the imagine that the scientific activity is a, is a bl cold blood activity, which basically you have in your computer, you have your discussion, you have always control, cold, it's completely wrong. The past continues through crisis, terrible crisis, which our moral is at the fifth level, to the enthusiasm, the, the few times in which we achieve the results and we overcome some difficulties. Uh, and eyes that will be difficult to forget. I like this picture, I am the oldest in the, in, the, in the group, we have achieved the result. Take a look to the eyes of these guys and girls and look at the different nationality. This is really something which is... Uh, uh, there are not many, many fields in which you can, you can, you can have this uh, spirit. I am the physics and space, are two of them. Uh, and just when everybody thought that this would have been another unsuccessful attempt, because we, for the first year we were not uh, very happy, it looked that there was nothing basically there. After all this effort, 20 years of effort, uh, no exposure, we started seeing, seeing something happening. And then, uh, very quickly, another, another piece of information. You, you fight 25 years, and it looks that uh, there is nothing. And then, in a few months, everything changed. So I continue to insist with my students, never give up. But when you have um, when a project, you know, and you have the feeling that uh, the project has not achieved the, the result that you were foreseeing, never give up. Go ahead, because... Uh, we lead uh, in a few months a complete, ch a complete change of attitude. Uh, we passed from having being depressed because there was nothing in the data to be on the uh, in front of a billion people, a billion uh, an audience of billions of persons looking at the seminar in which we announced the, the, the results. This could, have, could be very quick. And the two survivors of the young uh, uh, fellows of the sixties, François Aguilar and Peter achieved gain the, the Nobel Prize uh, because there they had the right view. They, 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 it was is there and their their view was correct. So now we mm, discuss a bit what have we learned from the beginning of the universe. Uh, basically we have understood the critical phase. So now we can describe in detail a phase that happened the uh, 10 to the minus 11 second after the Big Bang. So we don't know exactly before we have yes some before we have some hints about we loved it before, and we tell you something. Uh, but uh, from this moment on, we, are, we can be more precise. We can describe in full detail what, what, uh, what is happening in this, uh, in this period. Uh, but before going to this, uh, uh, what we know at the beginning of our universe. Basically, our universe is a very simple object. If you want to receive, it's a very simple receipt. There are two ingredients, matter, energy, and space time. Mix them together, you have a universe. That's it. I cannot give you the ingredients, luckily maybe, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a complex uh, receipt. Uh, we have understood that they are not here since ever, they are born together, and we know quite precisely that this happened at 13.8 billion years ago. Another thing that is le less known is this, I want to highlight this because for me it's really fantastic. Uh, we have measured in the last uh, 30 years, basically, uh, we have studied the universe as a physical object. You know? In the last 30 years, we have this opportunity. As physics has become uh, an experimental science. Now, there was a lot of speculation before, in the last 30, 40 years, has become a, a Galilean science, in which uh, you, you have uh, conjecture, and you can test the conjecture with experiments, with very precise experiments that can give you hints on the correctness of the conjectures. Uh, as we, since we are, we are uh, when we have a new atom, for example, the first thing we do, we take a look to this new system and uh, we try to understand the quantum numbers. Basically, we measure the quantum numbers of this uh, new system, trying to characterize the new system. 
And we have the, we did the same with the universe. The universe has a physical system, the entire universe, like a big act, a big mass structure. But what are the quantum number of this system? Very simple question. Uh, and the, the scientists discovered that the quantum number are all zero. <coughs> it was a surprise, an incredible surprise. So the universe has, a whole, uh, has an energy, an overall energy, which is zero. Which is strange. I would have imagined immense energy. If I put a droplet of water in the transforming energy, it's like a bomb, it's a huge, but there is space time, it's not only mass energy. Mass energy is a positive energy. Space time is negative energy, it's negative due to the attraction. It's, it's a potential which is negative. You can do calculating or launching a missile, you calculate the velocity and the, the power of the, of the engine because you start with the potential of this object at the surface the surface of the Earth, and then you give the energy enough to reach zero, if you want to, to reach the outer uh, the planets of the, of the solar system. So it's well known this. So put them together, total energy zero. And then you, you look for total charge, and zero. And then angular momentum, again zero. This is not by chance. Uh, our universe as the same quantum numbers of the vacuum state. Ah, ah, that means something. That means that it's still a vacuum state. If the two states have the same quantum numbers, they are identical, indistinguishable. So since the universe has the same quantum numbers of the vacuum state, the universe is a vacuum state. And then everything becomes easy. Because if it is a vacuum state, that means that it was before, before, it was a vacuum state even before becoming a universe. It becomes a natural sequence. In some sense, we have understood from where our universe originated. It is a vacuum state, it originated from the void. That means that it was already a vacuum state before it was. It went through a transformation, a metamorphosis. Not something originating from nothing, but something changing its feature, its characteristics but maintaining the main characteristic, which is still the vacuum state. So, I, I, I cannot resist to, to cite this, that was uh, his uh, zero, the theory. First and foremost, chaos came into being. And chaos, uh, it was always written with chaos, something disordered. But chaos in Greek is also, as the meaning of something that is very similar, that resembles a lot uh, the void, basically. Because uh, there is a Greco with the Kaino, which is an opening wide, casco, open mouth, and Kasma is a vortex. So it's like saying, first and foremost, the void came into the, 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 the origin of the universe is the void, is the vacuum. The vacuum. Uh, beware, the void is not nothing. Again, nothing is a, is a philosophical concept. Void is a material system. So when we say it's a, it's a vacuum state, it's a material system that follows the laws of physics, in particular the Heisenberg principle. So the void is not uh, something static, which is there, but it's something basically boiling, uh, fluctuating, uh, is never the same because at the microscopic level, uh, it would be impossible to have energy zero. No? Energy zero, 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 zero is forbidden by the uncertainty principle. If you have zero in average, that means that you have fluctuations. You have plus one, minus two, plus two, fluctuations. The void is full of fluctuations. What we call the, the, the quantic fluctuation or the quantistic form, something that is, is really uh, what happens in this fluctuation? The void is, in some sense, uh, contains everything, extracts from the, va from the, the vacuum, uh, particle and antiparticle, uh, for a fra tiny fraction of a second, and uh, it takes from vacuum delta E, a small amount of energy. You can, you can do it if delta T is small. The largest is delta E, the smallest is the delta T. Very simple, vacuum fluctuation. And then, eventually, in our own universe, one of these vacuum fluctuations picked up from the vacuum something that we call inflatons. We don't know exactly what it is. Are particles 
the third certain characteristics we, we can identify them, but we don't know exactly which one, of, which particle are they, because we have not yet discovered exactly all their properties. We, we are still trying to find out what exactly happened in those cells. But anyway, if you imagine uh, to extract from vacuum inflatons in a, in a very small fraction of time, 10 to the minus 35 seconds, uh, this uh, matter. Uh, together with a small bubble, space time, matter space time, still zero, they are still zero, they don't change this, but this inflate has the, the property of inflate, of making the bubble becoming larger. Becoming larger extracts from the vacuum other inflatons, so the, the push becomes larger and larger. It's the exponential growth in, in a very small amount of time, 10 to the minus 35 seconds. This uh, tiny super infinitesimal object tiny fracture, fract becomes like this, like a football ball, like this, 20 centimeter roughly, is, 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 is our universe already there. This is what we call cosmic inflation. Uh, at this time you have already a universe which is born for free. This is another fantastic thing. There is no need of energy to, to create a universe because the energy is still zero. So, is the have you heard that uh, here in Frankfurt there are many banks, no? there is no free lunch. I'm sure that some, some of the bankers have always uh, mentioned this uh, famous uh, phrase. Uh, no, it's not true. No? The, the, the universe is the, the, most, is the largest possible imaginable free lunch because it's a universe which is born for free, absolutely for free. And this is what you would have seen, I mean, I'm joking here, cannot be there, but imagine to be there, imagine to be at the end of the cosmic inflation, and you see something which is uh, uh, roughly speaking of these dimensions, and it contains every, every um, all the matter, all the energy, all the space-time of the universe in a very compressed form. It is a perfect universe. You, you take a look there, and, and what you see is basically elementary particles flying at the speed of light everywhere, all identical all masses, like a fog of photons. Imagine something like that. It's really hot. It continues to expand. It becomes colder and colder. If nothing would have happened at this universe, we would not be here, basically. That would be a, a good universe, but definitely useless. There would be no a perfect universe. I, I highlight it. Absolutely perfect, but totally useless. Because it would have had no evolution. No change, no transformation, no dynamics. And this is why it is important the exposure, because it is thanks to this change, to this transformation, to this catastrophe that happened 10 to the minus 11 seconds after the big bang, that we, there is a, what we call a, the, the, the breaking of the seal. The perfection was broken. Uh, particle started differentiate one from the other. The field, the, the, the element becomes colder. The Higgs boson is not able anymore to break, to stay alive, call it this way, and it, it becomes freezing in a sort of a field which occupies that. And this field changed in part. All the particles interacting with this field started being different one from the other. So they were a few particles didn't interact, a few other uh, had interaction, and at different mass, they differentiated that. It was anymore a perfect universe. It was a universe that was imperfect. It was, um, there were different, uh, different families and different parts. <coughs> this is what uh, we see today. Today we see a series of families, uh, for example, the core car, which is extremely, extremely light, no? 2 MeV, and, and the quark top, which is 170 GeV, you see, quarks, one is extremely light, the other one extremely heavy. This difference is extremely important, because if all would be identical, there would be no possibility to form stable matter. What is the world today? What, what are we made of? We are made of atoms molecules, and atoms are basically protons and neutrons, the nuclei, and electrons, 
orbiting around. This is the stable matter we know uh, of a star or, or a flower or a human being. But to produce stable matter, we need elements. And the elements are basically protons and neutrons, which are made by the lightest quarks. Without light, the, the lightest quark, we would not have the possibility of having stable and persistent matter. The, the lightest quark, up and down, they can group together to form this uh, elementary cell, which is the proton, which is extremely solid because it's put together by the strong force, gluons. The strong force keep them together, so the protons are forever. The lifetime of a proton is 10 to the 33 years. 10 to the 33 years. Uh, our universe, 1.4, 10 to the 10 years. That means that if our universe would have lived billions and billions of times more, the proton would have been, the proton of our body, of our bones, of this table, would have been there without any problem. This is why matter is persistent. So we live in a material world. Now we understand why. We understand that this tricky mechanism is, is necessary to transform the, the, the matter of the early universe in something that would have an evolution in persistent matter that will last for billions of years. Basically, we have understood the critical moment in the very early stage of our universe. Uh, basic, basically, this was the, the, the key element to allow the elementary particle, primordial ingredients, uh, to uh, start attracting each other, to form dust, uh, nuclei, atoms, galaxies, planets, and everything including dust. Uh, basically, we, have, we need to rewrite the books of physics. We have to, to change the. You see, I was telling you before, we didn't discuss, discuss technology, but I discussed the another vision of our world. From in the last 10 years, we have changed our vision of, of the world. Thanks to this, uh, we have uh, a story that can continue for billions of years. A story that would allow to, to form the first stars, the first galaxies, the, the solar system, the Earth, uh, up to now. Without this long story that lasted billions of years, in, 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 and stable matter continue to evolve, it would be impossible to, to have this kind of evolution. Then I go quickly to, the, to today. Basically, now the standard model is complete. We should be happy. We say, OK, now we have a complete picture. Unfortunately, that the standard model is not able to explain a lot of phenomena. So this is why we, we, we have to, to invent new solutions or new machines or new the theory. Uh, we don't explain the inflation. There is no particle of the standard model explaining inflation. Uh, we don't explain dark matter and dark energy. We don't know why um, uh, our world is made out of matter and antimatter has disappeared. There is a long list of questions, and we know already that we need another theory that will be a more complete theory in which the standard model will be a low energy erection of this theory. This is the, this is the basic idea. For example, about one quarter of our universe is made out of, of dark matter, unknown matter. We, it keeps together the galaxies. We see the gravitational effect of this matter, but we don't know what is made of. For example, our galaxy traditionally was seen this way. It's a beautiful spiral galaxy, uh, about 100,000 light years. Uh, but now we see in, in this completely different view. You see, now the 1,000, 100,000 light years are this one. There is a 1 million light years uh, sphere or spheroidal um, dark matter element. So you see the, the, the luminous part, uh, the stars, uh, planets, everything, is a tiny part of the, of the top. Dark matter accounts for five times the luminous matter. So. Is, is a substantial fraction of the unit. And we don't know what, is, what are the particles responsible of this. Uh, uh, well, it's quite embarrassing. Isn't it? We don't know the inflation. We don't know the dark energy, which is another 
strange energy that brings every galaxy to increase the, the speed of recession. It means an acceleration, a sort of anti-gravity, a sort of new properties of the space-time. We don't know. We have no um, description of this. Thing. So basically, still true what uh, Isaac Newton told that uh, our ignorance is still immense. We know only, roughly speaking, 4 or 5% of the universe and 95% is basically <laughs> uh, and The f physics uh, has changed dramatically. For example, in the past 40 years, uh, the, the discoveries in physics were guided by the standard model. Huh? That means that there was a theory describing the the major particles, and uh, scientists looked uh, to the best way to discover the, the particle that was still missing. You know? And you see, every time there was a discovery, there was a turning point. You know? So this was the discovery of the James I, and then the Y, and then the WZ, and then the top, and then the X. There was like an outer route with the, with, the clear, with the clear point. But, but now, basically, we are there. It's like uh, reaching a shore in the sea, and we know there is some uh, island somewhere, but we don't know where, in which direction. Now, things are becoming complex, difficult, because we have to, uh, we don't have a theory uh, telling us, look there, exactly there, and you will find something. Uh, we can, in some sense, uh, we have, we have to explore all possible uh, um, all possible areas in which a new physics may come. We don't know exactly when and where this will happen. We know it will happen, but we don't know in which form, when, and where. Uh, what we do today is basically we use two parts, uh, which are quite complementary. One is the traditional one, the high energy, basically. If we have the possibility to build a new accelerator with higher energy, we can explore more massive particles. Maybe the particles that uh, we don't know yet are so massive that they don't appear in the current accelerator. As the X boson didn't appear in the previous generation of accelerator. It's quite a simple story. So if we are able to build a new accelerator with higher energy, we might discover some uh, particle which is responsible of the mysteries that I was alluding before. Meanwhile, we have LHC, which still continue to work. So we can use high precision. Basically, we can have indirect uh, test of the, of the post presence of possible particles, because if there is a new massive particle not yet discovered, it interacts in some way with the, with the known particles. It, it gives some anomalies. The presence of these ghosts, uh, let's call them uh, ghost particle, too massive to produce them, in, in reality, can be inferred through anomalies, differences induced in known particles. This is why we need high precision. We produce millions of these bosons, and if we find something unusual which does not correspond to theory, then this would be the hint that there is an interaction with other particles, not yet discovered. So, basically, why we do uh, this. Uh, uh, we, we continue discussing the possibility of a new machine. I'm coming from Paris. Uh, last week there was an uh, international meeting in which we discussed uh, the new generation of accelerator beyond LHC. And this is what uh, we consider um, our dream, what we call the future circular collider. This is the Geneva area. You see the lake of Geneva. This is LHC. 27 kilometers. Imagine this is about 90 kilometers. It's a, it's a, it's a giant with respect to, the, to, 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 to what we, the accelerator we are so proud of. You know, something which is really gigantic. And take a look. Uh, uh, with FCCHH, we plan to produce 10 to the 10 X bosons. So at the time of the discovery, we, we discovered maybe a handful of them. And now we plan to. to to build a machine to produce 10 billion of Higgs bosons to study in detail this new particle that could give us additional surprises. Again, anomaly that could be new physics. This is the, the, the project, and there is a preliminary layout, but again, 
I have not put the the, the cost and the, and the time. <laughs> but I can anticipate the cost. The, the cost is not negligible. At the end of the conference, there will be a box. <laughs> uh, but 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 it's not uh, terribly high. Again, we are talking of a project that will start operation in 2045. So we are talking of 20 more years from now. And the second phase, which is the rocket machine, in 2070. So we are talking of an investment that is in the range of 25 to 30 billion euro over a century, basically. It's a, it's a huge amount of money, but again, to be confronted with the uh, with 10 years, or 100 years of exploration, so this will be another discussion, but just to be the... Basically, uh, we need a new generation of scientists to build a new scientific infrastructure, to produce new ideas, to follow basically the route of uh, by Galileo Galilei that you have used uh, as, a, as a landmark, uh, as a trademark for, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, festival, for this conference. Thank you very much.